Good morning. Welcome. Please come, sit down, join us. It's great that we are gathering the theological term that they put on this process. Um, though, having said that, I must say that personally, just a personal favour, I prefer that we did the way that we do the gathering at Massey Church, where you get a bacon butty. Um, yes, I've been at churches where coffee and tea are served before and stuff, but bacon butty is definitely top. Top it all. Uh, one of the ways we used to get our adult kids to go when I was at theological college to church was I was on an, ex, uh, an experiential placement outside of the Anglican church to one of the, uh, to, to Trent Vineyard. And there, oh, there's where my favorite plectrum's gone. Um, and there they used to do donuts and melon before the service. And so, uh, because I was on placement there, I would have to cycle in to help them set up Notts County Football Ground, because that's where they had the church at that time, for church. Um, but the, the Lou never had a problem getting uh, um, Becky and, and Andy to come to church, because it was donut church. Uh, and so they were always there a quarter of an hour early. Uh, um, but uh, yes, they do that, that same trip, which is often done in business nowadays. You have your refreshments at the start as people gather and connect. And uh, it is quite an appeal to go down for a bacon butty. I'm wondering whether you could just tell them and pop in for the bacon butty on your way to church here. <laughs> um, but who knows? But it's great to see you uh, talking, connecting, building community together. And we're going to, as we gather, give glory to God. To God be the glory. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please sit. 
<clears throat> we say together, we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We say, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard our prayer. Therefore our hearts will dance for joy. In word and song we will praise our God. Um, for all the notices in particular, um, obviously everything has restarted as we are heading into the uh, in, in, into the some, the year, and so just pray for all the work of the church, um, and that this year it will see um, some sort of growth, addition, ideally multiplication, but that's uh, another story altogether. Next Saturday we have a coffee morning, and this is. Um, just a general church one, I think, rather than to one of our mission partners. Um, so Anita is looking for help uh, for raffle prizes, for cakes, for bric-a-brac, and for people to turn up. Um, so uh, see you on Saturday, but do see Anita if you have any uh, ability to participate and to join in. There's also uh, that desire to uh, keep the flower rotor going and lively. And so if you could sign up in the Northex, um, you'll probably know uh, where that is, or sort of as you go around on the left-hand side, to put the flowers at the front. I'm sorry, the vicar is a bit large and tends to stand in the way of you seeing both lots. You, you can see those flowers, and you can see that side flower, but you can't see that side flowers, unless I step like this. Um, but putting some flowers at the front, bring, bringing in from God's creation uh, for us to see as part of our worship in the rich variety that we bring. Um, the other thing to note is that I'm going to do a Lent course. It's going to be four weeks. It's going to be based on the catechism, which, and it's called Resound, because basically um, the catechism was a way of teaching people before uh, people were literate. But my thought is that it is so easy nowadays to just have everything on your phone that you don't remember anything. So the discipline is going to be trying to remember stuff. You don't have to remember it all. I'm not testing you on whether you remember it all, but it is more aimed that if we have certain things at our mind's fingertips, it helps us with our faith and as we share our faith to learn certain of the basics. And so do uh, come and join in that. It's going to be on a Tuesday evening and a Thursday lunchtime. Um, and I will let you know the weeks when I finally booked those in. But I have had somebody, last week I'd said, um, we'll do an evening length course, as we often have. But I wasn't sure about doing a daytime one, but I have had some people asking me to do a daytime one. And so at least a small group is viable. So the daytime one will be a Thursday daytime. Um, and so after we've done, we'll do the BCP uh, morning service, we'll have tea and coffee, and then we'll do the Lent course around about uh, midday. Um, just, I'll sort of get clear in my mind whether it's going to be 12 or 12.30 start for that. So do think about which you can come to, Thursday, Tuesday evening or Thursday lunchtime. 
and uh, do, do a bit of work for Lent, a Lenten discipline of trying to learn something. The other thing I am looking for, and after we've done this first one in a sermon series on experiencing God, I'm looking for you to be prepared to volunteer just to share something about your experience uh, uh, when you experience God in your life. It's not after necessarily something that's really high and amazing. It can be as simple as when I first held my child, I realized there must be a Father God who holds me. It can be that simple. Um, but just looking at sharing together uh, and going in confidence that we do experience something of the divine in our daily lives. Let's turn to the first of our readings from Scripture. Our first reading this morning is from Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Moses wasn't looking for it, but he suddenly found himself in the presence of God and aware that he was in the presence of God. And we remind ourselves that that is where we are called to be as we say this, sing this prayer together, to be in your presence. Let's stand, let's sing. To be in your presence, to sit at your feet, Where your love surrounds me and makes me complete. 
This is my desire, O Lord, this is my desire, this is my desire, O Lord, this is my desire, to rest in your presence, not rushing away. as we continue that desire to be with God as we have our second reading from the prayer book of ancient Israel. The second lesson is Psalm 119, verses 1 through to 16. Aleph. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Beth. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. This is the word of the Lord. I'm really sorry to say that I'm going to get you doing some work this morning. Uh, So first of all, can you find a pen? If you haven't got a pen... Uh, then um, there's some pens and pencils here. Uh, there's there's going to be some paper that arrives. Would you be kind enough to take that up that side of the aisle? Just make sure. Jane, would you be kind enough to take these up this side of the aisle? Jane, would you be kind enough to take these up this side of the aisle? Yeah. And then I will go and get the work. So this morning, uh, the, the teach is going to be in quite a different style. Um, uh, in that we're going to do it with a handout. I'm going to get you doing some work as we go along. Um, and so... Um, it's not my intention for the whole sermon series to be done like this, especially for Tom and Graham, worried they're going to have to produce handouts. Um, I am open to people going, actually, that's refreshing to do that. We can do that occasionally. Um, It's good sometimes to mix the styles up a little bit. Um, Oh, there you go. Thank you. There we go. A couple there. Is it just you, Jeff? Okay. 
And some of you are going, I've left my reading glasses at home. Oh, there's a beautiful book out there, and it will come more into play halfway through uh, today's sermon. There's a structure uh, today, uh, not just a lot of words on a handout, um, but it's called Start With The Why, and so we've uh, pulled together a mission statement, and in that mission statement are in particular five things uh, that we do. And this is, this is a sermon series that's going to look at the first of those things over the next number of weeks. And so in those five things, and hopefully eventually, I'll say this enough times that you will get it, it is, first of all, we experience God. And that's our first and highest calling. Uh, and from that, we are witnesses to that. And then third, we share that with others. And then, in part of sharing that with others, we build connections and we build the values and we build the kingdom of God and its values uh, in the world uh, through those connections. And in particular, those first three, my mother made the best Christmas pudding ever. That was my experience of the Christmas pudding that she made. I am only a witness to that when I let others know that my mother made the best Christmas pudding ever. And in the end, because us children proselytised this Christmas pudding elsewhere, my mother used to end up making about 12, 15 Christmas puddings every year for various people who wanted to have some of my mother's Christmas pudding, which just proves it was the best ever but it only gets to be somebody else's experience when I share the Christmas pudding with somebody else. So I can, I can experience it, I can witness to it, and I can share it to others. And that's the first three stages of there, is that it's one thing for me to experience God, it's another for me to be brave enough to own up to that and witness to that, it's another for me to give it to somebody else or to help somebody else to receive it. Uh, in that sense, I can be a witness to that statement. My mother does the, by witnessing, by saying, my mother does the Christmas, best Christmas pudding. But as you know, with any three-year-old with the best chocolate ever, they're not going to share it with you. So those are the three stages uh, that we start with and will be taking us through the next few months. And we're starting with that, in that sense, the equivalent of, experience, of me experiencing my mother's Christmas pudding, that we experience God. And uh, John 10, 33 says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. And the starting point is that God calls you by name, calls you individually. If you notice in the passage we had read from Moses, God calls Moses, Moses. He doesn't go, oi you, or NS708155D, which actually happens to be my national insurance number, because I don't know Moses' national insurance number, and call him by number. He calls him by name. And here, and I think in the Bible it's true to say, there are some philosophies where to to know the name is to have some sort of power over them and they're due that once they had the name they could do sort of witchcraft and control them. But actually, if you look in the Bible, uh, knowing somebody by name is about building a personal relationship with them. And so when we are called in creation to name the animals, we're called to be, in that sense, stewards caring for them, to have a personal relationship with them, to have a connection to them. And God calls us by name because he wants to have a connection to us. And then in Job 33, 14, it says, For God does speak, now in one way, now in another, though no one perceives it. We don't perceive all the ways that God speaks, but God speaks in lots of different ways. 
And actually, it's my postulation here today that God speaks to us each individually. He has a language of love with which he speaks to each one of us uh, as he talks to us. Now, let me put it this way. If I had two children, my son loved football, and my, this is very stereotyped, this isn't sort of like that sense, it could be the other way around, but my son loves football, my daughter loves ballet. It wouldn't be a very good language of love if I said, oh daughter, I love you, I'm going to take you to the football this afternoon. Or if I said to my son, oh, son, I love you, I'm going to take you to the ballet this afternoon. What would be a good way of communicating is go to my son, oh, it's great, I want to spend some more time with you, let's go to the football together and experience that together. And to the daughter, let's go off and watch the ballet together, even though I hate it. But you like it, so let's have this experience together. And God knows us by name. He calls us and relates to us as an individual. To the best of my knowledge, the only person that God has ever spoken to through a burning bush is Moses. He speaks individually to us in a way that connects with us and where we are. And I want to very briefly get you doing some work. And this is not going to be long-winded. It's not a full ass assessment. But this is just to start you thinking. And I have two books on my shelf at home. And if you wish to borrow them out of what I say, you're quite welcome uh, to borrow them. And the first of them is Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. And in this book, he looks at the ways that God speaks to us and suggests that there are, I think it was nine uh, and we'll go through three. And what I want you to do is, as I go through, just put a number, I think I put, put on the sheet between naught and five, it might be easier to go between one and five, because if this is sort of like, no, no, that's not me, then it's right down at one. And if it's sort of like, oh yeah, sometimes and that's, a, that's a three, and you've got a sort of bit of a two for somewhere in between, and then if it's, yeah, that's, that, that, that is, that's how God really connects with me, then it's a five. And it's very quick, first impressions, um, and I'll just go very quickly through them. Each one of these is a chapter, and I almost did this as our sermon series. Um, it's a sermon series I've done before. We went through these nine chapters uh, over nine weeks and just explored them in a the church to help people to get that God speaks now in one way in Job, now in another, and they are not completely uh, sort of uh, they're not completely exclusive. Neither is the, does it stop God speaking in other ways. In that sense, God speaks, I believe, in more ways than this. But these are nine suggested by Gary. And the first is the naturalist, the person who God speaks to outdoors. Those of you who you'll listen to the sermon, but you get it when you're walking back home and you're crossing the stream and walking up towards um, the Quaker house and you're in nature and suddenly it goes, oh, now it makes sense. Or those of you who are walking your dog at dawn and the sun rises and God speaks. And you find it far easier praying when you're out and you're on your feet and you're walking. Or maybe you're out and you're sitting by a stream. The sensate, those who love the senses. And uh, sort of how God speaks when you feel, you touch, you see things. Uh, I think this would include those who love the beauty that surrounds that. Whether that's a painting or a ceiling. Uh, whether that's uh, the music uh, and the sounds, uh, and it would cover a variety of styles. For some, it's not when you experience it out there, but when it's you do it yourself and you're actually painting. I went to a wonderful conference uh, on pioneer ministry, trying to reach those who are not yet churched. And one of the leaders uh, spent his time with a paint board and easel because when he was listening to a message, as he started to get inspiration to draw, that's to paint, that's when God spoke to him uh, and there. Then there's those who are traditionalists. You like things to always have the same ritual, symbol, the way of pattern of doing it, that through the familiar, that, that it works for you. And then the aesthetic, the person who likes to be alone and quiet. As ritual came into the church, more especially as the Roman Empire took on Christianity, 
There were those who realized that mocking up a Byzantine throne room in church didn't do it for them, and they would go off and find quiet and solitary places, hermitages, we call them the Desert Fathers and Mothers. The activists, then actually when you're doing, God makes sense to you. That when you go and you take part in uh, the, 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 the protests and stuff that happen around COP26 or 28 or whatever we're going to be on to next time, uh, 29 I think next time, when you are advocating for those who are least off or those, when you're taking part in fair trade and changing your life to make a difference and you're doing things that as you do things that echo the kingdom of God, then it makes sense to you and it works for you. Uh, it says here, loving God through confrontation. When you challenge what's wrong in the world, and look for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and God's goodness to come more, then God is speaking to you. The caregiver, those, and Lou's probably one of these, when you're fostering a child, when you're caring for the elderly, when you're showing love one to another, then God is there in the midst with you. The enthusiast, those who, and I think the enthusiast in terms of mystic, sort of mysticism doesn't quite fit into this, the mystics, but uh, yeah, when you're experiencing something of the nebula, something that's beyond, when you are carried away in worship, whether that is stunned by multi-part harmonies as you hear Handel's Messiah plays, or raising your arm and dancing in the exuberance of charismatic worship, God speaks to you as your emotions connect with the divine, uh, the contemplative who sits in adoration and love of God and finds space for nothing else. And the intellectual, those who love to read theological books, who love the heavier hymns, not because of the music, but because of the words, uh, love to find out what ineffably sublime actually means rather than just sing it. You do know what ineffably sublime means, don't you? Indescribably beyond uh, uh, in, in the, that that is beyond in God. And all of these are nine of the ways, though not all of the ways, that God speaks to us individually. Then Richard Foster, in his book, A Sounds of Living Water, suggested that the, the church then has grouped these experiences of God into ways that it does church uh, to try to help people to experience God. So again, do it on a score of one to five very quickly. So the contemplative tradition, the tradition and the one round here would be the Quaker House, the, or what we do on Good Friday, that includes silence and space that repeats the same phrase of two lines as when we do Taze songs, but in the contemplative tradition, you may just sing that for a quarter of an hour as you just dwell on one aspect of God and try to suck every bit out of it like you're sucking the slice of an orange. The holiness tradition, Wesley and the holiness movement that started the Methodist church as a group of friends at college decided to live differently and try to live markedly differently and try to live holiness from the inside out, try to live God's virtues in the world and find that as we seek after God's holiness, the charismatic tradition, seeking the spirit of God, which does permeate the whole of creation, to be in touch with that as it moves and empowers us, the social justice tradition, as we work on behalf of God's kingdom and values in the world, uh, and the evangelical tradition, as we centre ourselves around the word of God and the incarnational tradition. This is both the sacramental tradition, but also incarnational, is that we live the life in the world, and the life we live in the world makes a difference, um, but it's also the sacramental tradition. And in these, you'll start to realize that even within each of these categories, and hopefully you've had chance very briefly as I'm going knocking one to five, that there's all sorts of tensions that may be within it because people may love things that are traditional or new. What I mean here 
is sort of some people, it's only when you've been doing something for two years that it starts to really be bed down for them. For others, uh, doing it for two years is like leaving the same lot of flowers up at the front of church for two years. It only makes sense to them when it's new and it's fresh and it's the vibrance of God's creation now and you can put yourself somewhere on that continuum. Uh, for those who want continuity and the sameness that it's the same every week and um, for those who like variety that they want the vicar to mix it up and maybe give them a handout once in a blue moon uh, and change it round. Uh, those who want to be active and do something and like messy church, they're making things. And so they were doing about uh, the wise men today and the star. And so they had little biscuits of the star to decorate and to help to bring the message home. I was going from table to table just saying, ah, um, if I take this star and move it away and the kids were then going, ah, you'll follow the star. Yeah. Where's that connect to the story? And then just having that chalk about that making sense by doing it in the physical, the active rather than the still. Uh, in a particular style, oh, we've got to do it pure BCP, which is what we do Thursday, or a much more eclectic style, which is what we do here as we have a mixture of styles on a Sunday. And we have a mixture of styles different weeks. But even in the service, we have a mixture of music styles and eras that the music is picked from. Some people are more cerebral head, some are more heart based and actually that was picked up uh, in various ways in Gary Thomas's stuff. And those who like to learn things by doing them experientially and I understand it when I've done it. When I've taken my bike apart and cleaned it and put it back together then I understand the bike and those who want to understand through the head and hopefully you can quickly put yourself on all those. Then you get into sort of different ways of learning, visual, auditory, gusto olfactory, uh, though there's not that many things that you can learn. Well, the cooking, you can learn gusto olfactory. Does it smell right? Oh yeah, that's right, and how that triggers, but also how smell triggers memory. And so some people use that as, as part of a learning technique, or digital, the probably cerebral. Hopefully that has got you starting to think. Doesn't matter if it's exactly you, but if you've scored it a little bit each way and you've started to go, oh, these are the sort of things that work for me, and oh, nah, whenever the vicar does that at the front, doesn't work for me at all. It's got you started. And if you turn over the page, we have something from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, probably the most famous of the statements from the Westminster Shorter Catechism the Westminster Shorter Catechism is not a Catholic creed. Uh, in that sense, a Catholic creed is a universal creed, so it's one that all the churches accept. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is uh, written, obviously, Westminster, uh, as the church went, it moved into the Reformation, and it was those that were much more Calvinist trying to shape the church. It was adopted formally, I think, by the, the Scottish church, um, but uh, I, it's just one of those things that is influential uh, technically in the Anglican church but isn't one of our accepted uh, because it, 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 in that sense it's one side of the church not the whole of the church but where they start is they ask the question in a classic catechism because a catechism is a question and answer process what is the chief end of a human actually in the, in the catechism is what is the chief end of man of a man um, but I made it more inclusive because actually that's the way it would have been meant in that sense. What's the chief end of a human? And the answer is a human's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And then as is classic with that age of early modernity, uh, it starts off by making, postulating um, uh, propositional statements and then giving some proof texts. But what I want to do for you now, just briefly, is to say, actually, you can approach that more holistically from the whole narrative of the Bible. The Bible is predominantly story, then is poetry and, and sort of wisdom, literature, and then sort of more propositional statements. And if you think about the story of the Bible, and you think about it from the point of view of priests, okay? 
The story of the Bible, often if you're doing this and you're going through saying, what's the big story arcs of the Bible? You've got to start off in creation, Genesis. You've got to go through the middle, the salvation of Jesus, and you've got to go to the end, where it is what will finally happen in the culmination of everything by God. And we live between, obviously, the work of Jesus and the end. And so going right back to the start, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm not going to go through it all in great detail, but he created humanity to have a particular role in it. We've already mentioned that humanity's job was to name everything. Uh, And I've suggested that naming is not just about uh, naming something, nor is it in uh, other senses about taking power over something. Naming is about having a relationship with something. And God named Adam and Eve in chapter one and in chapter two in the telling of the story, it says God told Adam that he was to name everything, have a relationship with it. And it puts Adam and Eve, humanity, at a really special place in that connection between God, who met with them each day to talk about what they've been doing, and the rest of creation. A role that is, in that sense, the priest's role, to somehow connect heaven and earth, to bring the earth to heaven in intercession, to bring heaven to earth in mission, and connecting the two and fulfilling God's purposes, representing God into the world, and bringing the two together. They're not yet called priests. Then you move forward into everything starts to go wrong. Humanity doesn't do its role. First of all, that is a a continual descent for humanity into more and more brokenness and is a knock-on descent for the whole of creation. And God decides to do something about it and chooses Abraham and his descendants, not because Abraham and his descendants are good, but because God is faithful to his calling and covenant. He is the God who is faithful and he is going to do something to put it all back right. And as he chooses Abraham, he says that through you, all nations will be blessed. And it starts to make Abraham sound a little bit like a priest. He's not called a priest yet, but it starts to make him as the one who is connected to God and will bless all of humanity so that then, ultimately, humanity will start to fulfill its calling in God's world. Doesn't make that one explicit at Genesis, but that's the pattern that we're looking for as we build it up through the story. Then we get to Moses, the story that we've had to get. And Moses is called, as one of the descendants of Abraham, to bring about the liberation of the rest of the descendants of Israel. And when they are liberated and taken to Mount Sinai, one of the things he says about this whole people is that they are to be a nation of priests. They are to be humanity standing between God and the world, bringing the world to God in intercession and bringing God to humanity as they fulfill their vocation and do the mission of God and represent God into the world. Then we come ultimately to Jesus, who is our great high priest, the one who does the work that will bring heaven and earth back together, reckon, and as Paul will say, will reconcile everything together in God, bringing it all back to the way it is, because Jesus is the new Adam, the Adam 2.0, the one, the, the upgrade that we're all called to, as we get upgraded to be like him by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And as you follow that through Paul, and through, uh, in particular, the book of Hebrews, you find that we are called to be a priestly nation, seeking to bring the rest of humanity back to God and God to the rest of humanity, so that as we come into Revelation, you see most clearly, so that the rest of the world can be brought back to God and God to the rest of the world and heaven and earth you reunited, such that at the end, God is at the center. We no longer need a light because God is our light at the center of a great city that's at the center of heaven and earth 
reunited and everything pulled together. And that means that you are part of the priesthood, all believers, and as Paul would say, the whole of creation is longing for you to be revealed because when you're revealed, doing what humanity is called to be in that bridge between heaven and earth, then it gets put right. And creation wants to see you shining as Christ lights in the world. But that's too much for you to do. But the good news is you don't do it by yourself. The Holy Spirit does it in you such that you follow the example of Jesus, our great high priest, who bridges that gap. And standing on the bridge that Jesus makes, we can fulfill our vocation. And so it is our vocation to experience God and to experience the God from the point of view of being creatures in the world. It's our vocation, our calling, the very nature of our humanity that we engage with God and we engage with the world. That is part of that big story of it all. And sometimes that will be those big moments of the burning bush. And you might be able to think of, I went to this conference, I went to Cliff College, a Bible college, or to Cape and Ray. I went to Walsingham, or I was, I was just walking through um, the, the abbey up near Skipton. And I sensed something amazing. I heard a voice, I saw something. And it might be the ordinary things of when I do my prayer time, when I read the Bible, when I walk up the Gritstone Trail, when I am with the family, when I come to church, I sense something of the divine. But that is our calling. That is what God expects for us. So what I've got there, and this is probably more important than the first page, the first page was to get you warmed up, is there's three points. And I want you just to think about perhaps three times you've experienced God and to write them down. Very briefly, when my child was born, first time I heard Handel's Messiah, when the vicar spoke, when the previous vicar spoke, not this one, when <laughs> whatever it is, When do you experience God? And you won't have time to do all of it today. But actually, one of the things that's found in mission is that actually, if you ask people who are not Christian, who don't come to church, whether they've experienced something supernatural, experienced something of the divine, experienced something that's beyond themselves, uh, whatever gentle wording doesn't make it sound too religious to them, most people actually can articulate some experience they've had where they felt that they connected to something beyond themselves. It's actually Descartes' argument for God, if you read Descartes' philosophy. That we can sense, we can experience God, and so God must be true, and that's, I think, therefore I am. And so therefore, because we can experience him, he must be true. You can see how sad the vicar is and how he, <laughs> he sort of reads Descartes and remembers it. <clears throat> uh, if you're brave enough, turn to somebody who's by you and say, just briefly, one of the times you've experienced God.
And the good news here is that in doing that, all of you have stepped beyond the stage of experiencing God to witnessing to a time you've experienced God in terms of our mission statement. Uh, so if you've just gone and talked to somebody and said, I experienced God here, then you move from just your personally experiencing God to witnessing to that. Witnessing isn't difficult. It can take bravery, but it's not difficult. And the question out of this, in terms of if God has a love language that he speaks to you, is, and it's what the next space is for, and I want you to take this home and just reflect on it, because you may think of other instances, is are there common themes in the way God speaks to me? Because part of your own personal devotional life is to find those ways that you can access God and fulfill your vocation to stand as part of the priesthood of old believers between God and the world and to know what that is. Actually, another part of this is to learn to broaden out your experiences of God and hear God in all the voices with which he speaks, if you can, um, uh, so that you can go to things that aren't actually in your particular favorite way of doing it, but still know that God's there. But that's another story altogether and not one uh, for today. Bar, hopefully, everybody who spoke to you had a different experience that they shared with you bar knowing that actually as a church we all have lots of different ways that we connect with God and part of the challenge of church life is how do we do that in all those variety of ways and here as a church we have lots of different styles of service so that hopefully people can find lots of different ways that God might be able to speak to them but how can we be sensitive to the range of ways that God speaks. My sincere hope is when I do something at the front of church which really doesn't scratch your itch, it's hopefully scratching somebody else's itch. Uh, or in inviting us all to perhaps broaden out the way in which we do this. And that sort of sense of the way that somebody is different is just below halfway down on the page. I think that, and sort of, I think that my wife experiences God in a way that is different from me. To be aware of other people and what speaks to them. And, I th and think about one person, maybe your wife. And they may have just shared with you if you're sitting next to them. Or, uh, I think, so Terry might go, I think that Rachel experiences God different from me. And her preference leans into this. And I wonder if I can learn to appreciate the way that she, he, experiences God. To see through their engagement of God something that I don't yet manage to touch God with. And this moves us into the last sort of section that I really want to get to. And that is that the church then has patterns of presenting God, traditions, ways of doing things. Uh, and perhaps this church has a way of doing it. And what is that for the church rather than just what is it for me? But our community has changed a lot over the last 50 to 100 years. Take whichever peg you want to take for it. And if the church is doing it in this way, especially getting to the missional question, what would help the community to experience God? And you might want to look at how news readers have changed in the last 50 years. 50 years ago, they'd be sitting down behind their decks, wrapping their pieces of paper together. I'm reading to you in the Queen's English. Do you remember that? Uh, now, uh, pro probably most news <laughs> services spend a lot of time with the desk not visible. If you're watching 
uh, breakfast news, you'll see a little coffee table there. If you're watching some of the do documentaries and stuff in the evening, they're standing uh, right in front of you with a big screen that they're tapping away on. And they're communicating differently in a different world. And so what... And ultimately, as we work through the mission statement, we'll be thinking more about mission later. But as we think about God still calls every single person in Disley to experience them, God, to have a relationship with God that then affects the way they live in the world so that the whole world is brought into God's kingdom and put to rights. How do we help them to experience God? Not just understand that my wife, my partner, my son, my daughter, uh, the person sitting next to me on the pew experiences God different. How do we help? That's where, actually, a lot of my thinking is done. That's the reason why I generally don't use notes uh, to preach, because it's about communication like this, and society's changed. Uh, it's the reason that I don't stand behind a pulpit, because, again, those are seen as power moves, and it's wanting to try and communicate in ways that will hopefully speak more broadly in our culture to where things are at. Because if God still speaks, as Job says, now in one way, now in another, then God still speaks to each of us in all sorts of different ways. And together, in all those different ways that God speaks, we form the church and we have to be tolerant of each other and the different styles that each of us have. But we also have to be mindful that God wants to speak and is trying to speak to the rest of the people in our parish, in our world. And to, we are mindful that we've got to find voices that speak to them uh, in that experience. So to summarize, God knows us each by name. God speaks to us each with his own individual language of love for us. God speaks to everybody else in our church. And together in our acts of worship, we try to create an environment in which God can speak to us. But also mindful that we're trying to speak in a way that God might speak to the rest of our community if they click on our uh, video of the service as they follow it and it gets put on Facebook. If they wander into church and stay for a service. As our highest calling, and humanity's highest calling, is to experience God, to stand as part of the priesthood of humanity, standing there in the place that God has called us to between heaven and earth, made, as the psalm would say, a little lower than the angels, uh, so that we can, can be part of reflecting the image of God into his world so that the world can be set to rights. We've got all sorts of problems with wars around the world. We've got all sorts of problems with global warming and pollution around the world. We've got all sorts of problems with an election coming up this year. And the answer to all the questions of what will put it all right is ultimately... If humanity finds its purpose of connecting to God and connecting to the world and living out God's life in the world and bringing the world in intercession to God and that we as the priests of all, priesthood of all believers here are part of that connection point between the divine and the mundane, between God and humanity, between God and his whole creation and finding that as we experience God we are invited to step into being fully human. So let's just pray. And hold on to those little thoughts you've had about how God has spoken to you. Father, we invite you to send your Holy Spirit to help us each to become more aware or more affirmed of how you speak to us so that we can be confident of your calling in our life. That we stand in our prayers between you and earth. 
bringing humanity and the earth to you in intercessions. I'm bringing you to the earth as we worship and witness to the faith and the experience that we have. Lord, confirm us in our calling to be humans in the image of Christ. Amen. I'm wanting to strip it all back to just that, that at the heart of what we're called to in humanity is just to engage with God. Um, we're going to sing our next song. When the music fades, all is stripped away. While you're standing, let's say together what we believe about the God whom we know. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again in accord he is at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Please sit. Through Jesus, we are at that intersection of heaven and earth as Jesus comes to us by the Spirit. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done.
writes, Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's actually a beautiful collect for what we've been trying to reflect on today. If you do nothing else, perhaps take that collect away with you and meditate on it. We come to our prayers of intercession. Jeff. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Strengthen all your church throughout the world in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, help us to listen to your voice, still calling us to unity in our diversity. We pray for church leaders everywhere, that they may work together and promote unity among all Christians. Lord, we give you thanks for all those who work hard to support the life of our churches here in this parish. For Stuart, our vicar, for all his worship team, and especially for those leading and taking part in our young people's worship today at Messy Church. May our church family grow in faith and bring more people within our community to hear your word and to know Jesus as a friend. We pray that in life we all aim to have a sense of direct personal connection and intimacy with you, our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless and guide Charles, our King, and we pray for him especially during his time in hospital. Give wisdom to all in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and of peace that we may honour one another and seek the common good. We pray for the leaders of all countries of the world. Help them so that they together they may pursue the search for peace. Above all, we pray for those parts of the world where life is a continual struggle and where peace is too often a dream drowned under a sea of violence. We pray for peace will become a reality for all. We pray for people in Ukraine. We pray for all across the Middle East, especially people in Gaza. We pray that people of Christian, Jewish and Islamic faiths can develop mutual respect and learn to live together in harmony and without conflict. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the community of which we are a part, for those who share with us in its activities, and for all who work to help make this village and the wider area an enjoyable place to live. We thank you, Father, for all those whose work underpins our lives in this nation. 
We thank you for those who day and night maintain our public services, for the police, for those who respond to emergencies, and for those who work in the health service and in social care. Teach us to remember that all our lives depend upon the work of many minds and hands. And we pray that we may live thankfully and in unity as members of one human family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you will comfort those in need and also help us to be aware of those in difficulty. Please guide us so that we may be more sensitive to our neighbours' needs. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in mind, body or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We bring before you in the quietness of our minds those people for whom we have special concern. In the silence, let us list them. The sick. The lonely. The oppressed. Those who struggle for meaning in their lives. Help them to find their help and support in you, we pray. To be aware of your comforting presence. Knowing that in your hands, they are always safe and loved. Hear us as we remember those who have died in the faith of Christ. We remember with deep gratitude those who have now gone before us to be with Christ, but have left their mark on our lives by previously giving us love and laughter and have left us with precious memories. We hold them in our hearts, knowing that you, Lord, hold them in your hands. Be with those bereaved and give them the faith to look to your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, as we prepare for the week ahead, help us to remember that we are sisters and brothers in Christ. Help us overcome our conflicts and our differences and to be united one with another by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we commend ourselves and the whole of creation to your unfailing love, rejoicing in the fellowship of Mary, John, and of all your saints. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As Jeff was praying amongst the prayers, and I'm not going to comment about every single prayer he made, he commented about Messy Church. And one of the good news stories of last year is uh, generally our attendance is slightly up to the right, um, but in particular, Messy Church and altogether to worship. Our connection uh, with children has seen a big percentage jump. Uh, so those are two really good news stories. So that prayer that he prayed, God is already answering. Uh, let's continue to pray that he continues to answer it into the year. Um, yes, uh, the 8 o'clock BCP and St. John's have both struggled and gone down slightly. But broadly speaking, across the right, it's, there is some recovery post-COVID. Uh, I know it feels hard at times and uh, not what it used to be. But there is, is some signs of recovery, and in particular in Messy Church uh, and in the All Together to Worship service into this 11 o'clock. 
and that's great things uh, to see. So I'm delighted to see those anyway. Um, but yeah, we're going to finish by singing Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, because it all starts from our experience of God. Going back to my rather silly little comment about my mum's Christmas pudding, I've got something to witness about if I have tasted my mum's pu Christmas pudding and I can go, my mum made the best Christmas pudding. If I never taste it, all I go is, my mum... So, at the end, we're going to finish with this great prayer. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Let me experience you guiding me, Lord, because that is what we have to share with the world, the engagement experience we have with God. This is our offer to him. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Lord, we give you songs of praises because you have created all things and given us a role in your creation because you have redeemed us through Jesus Christ and given us a role in his salvation because you will bring all things together and heaven and earth will you united when Christ shall return. And until then, our work is not completed. So we give you our lives and this money for your glory and for your purpose. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.